I am here to introduce the panel. Uh, thank you, Stuart, and everyone on the panel for joining us today. Um, I have a passage that I'm going to read off that kind of explains and introduces what we'll talk about a little bit here today. Um, so I'll be reading this off. Feel free to take any notes on some interesting things that you might be able to look into after or might be discussed uh, as this panel continues. Um, so there's a really worthwhile book that sometimes get, gets passed around and, and Stuart recommends called The Finite and Infinite Games uh, by James P. Kars. That is a good philosophy book. Um, it's short, uh, but incredibly dense and concise in a sort of flowing, always going forward kind of way. Here's a passage. Infinite players look forward, not to a victory in which the past will achieve a timeless meaning, but towards ongoing play in which the past will require constant reinterpretation. Infinite players do not oppose the actions of others, but initiate actions of their own in such a way that others will respond by initiating their own. Blockchains are about resources, applications, shared infrastructure, individual freedom to act, to know, social advancement, and more. But fundamentally, they are about coordination. We make the world computer, and therefore, the world computer makes us. How much agency do we have, and what do we aim for, really, in using it? Uh, we'd like to welcome Stuart and the whole panel to the stage for many reasons, um, but the ones we'd like to point out is that he's popularized the personal computer. Um, it could have been just called the small computer, but it's called the personal <laughs> computer. Microcomputers, they were, yeah. <laughs> and coined the phrase, information wants to be free. Uh, some of the rest of it will be touched on the panel. Um, the, the other panelists we'd like to welcome are Wendell Davis and Althea Allen to the stage. Um, Wendell is an Ethereum community member, uh, an early member of Amisa Go, um, and, excuse me, um, while Althea Allen is an early member of the Amisa Go community. Apologies. Um, they are here as infinite gamers, dedicated members of the Ethereum community, the blockchain community, the decentralization space, the human race, and space in general. Uh, one more passage from the book before we start. Infinite players are not serious actions in any story, but the joyful poets of a story that continues to originate what they cannot finish. Thank you all very much, and please welcome. All right. Maybe we get the controller. I'm not here for that, I'm here for this. <laughs> All right, what do you want? <laughs> Welcome. So, yeah. Stuart, you have been there for many a movement. You mm -hmm. rarely put your name on things, mm -hmm. but you have been often behind the scenes, behind the camera. Um, I had to do some research myself in preparation for this, and as I was sort of tracing your story, it was rather mind-blowing how many times your name popped up in things that I had heard of, things that had influenced me, things that had influenced the people who have influenced me. Um, so we're hoping that you can bring some of that perspective to us hmm. today. Um, but before that, I would like to let you tell your own story. I know that you have some slides, and just tell us some of the things that you have lived through. And Want me to do that now? I would love you to do that right All now. Right. Um, let's see what we've got. I guess it starts with the psychedelics. <laughs> Clearly it is not finished with psychedelics. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I uh, was in the thick with Ken Kesey, Mary Pranksters. We organized the biggest acid test called the Trips Festival in San Francisco. And it put together all the creative artistic groups in the Bay Area in one place for one night and set in motion the idea that audiences should not exist as audiences, that there should be no spectators, and Burning Man carries on that tradition to this day. Um, probably, I should say that my sense of what I do in the world is I hack civilization. I'm trying to figure out kind of ingenious, uh, low-effort ways to make a difference that helps civilization go better. 
And I'm sure my best, at least most efficient hack was, again, on the effects of LSD, coming up with this button, why haven't we seen a photograph of the whole Earth yet in 1966? And um, that was sort of strange because we'd been in space for 10 years at that point, and neither the Soviet Union or the US had taken any significant pictures from space. So I was trying to you know, give a paranoid twist on it. And indeed, a year later in 67, the first photographs emerged from a weather satellite, ATS. It was in newspapers and nobody paid much attention to it. But it was the one that was available when I started my major hack, I suppose, uh, exactly 50 years ago, the whole Earth catalog, where the um, image of the Earth was always on the cover. It tried to be comprehensive. And the main uh, event of it was access to tools. And I'll come back to that. But what really happened with the Earth image was at the end of 1968, when homesick astronauts orbiting the moon took photographs of their home from our home from a great distance. And what made that photograph called Earthrise most powerful for everybody, it reframed everything, it replaced the mushroom cloud as the sort of um, standard icon of our times and of civilization. It did that because there's a dead planet in the foreground and a clearly living planet that happens to be ours. And it's surrounded by a quite frightening vastness of space. It's a hard vacuum. And you get a sense of, of finiteness and fragility. What I was doing with the whole Earth catalog in terms of access to tools, I learned uh, last night from uh, Cory Doctorow that he based sort of the way Boing Boing does reviews on the way we did it in the whole Earth catalog. And they were just short access to tools, to skills. Um, the best book on learning how to fly was done in the 40s by Langewisher. Uh, a really important book that came out in the 60s and 70s was Our Bodies, Ourselves from the Boston Women's Collective. And basically, it went against what medicine had done up to that point, is basically treat a woman's body as, as uh, disease. <laughs> and uh, the doc female doctors and so on of this group put together a book that was a manual of having a woman's body. Uh, there's craft to it. Uh, it takes tuning, it takes maintenance, it takes uh, enjoying it at a cellular level, and all of that was in there in this book, and it was one of the core books of the women's movement, actually. Fifty years later, I discovered after various people came to me and said, well, you know, reading the whole Earth catalog got me out of Nebraska, got me out of Indiana, got me out of some small place where I was, and it got me going on, you know, what I do now, and they tell me these origin stories. And in summary, what I noticed it does, and I think that blockchain is doing this, is it confers agency. It gives people the freedom, the sense of freedom to choose to do damn near anything and just go forth and try. And the opposite of agency is victimhood. So one of the things I wrote somewhere along in the process was a good project is to just unmake victims. Start with yourself, branch out from there. One of the things that, that grew out of the whole Earth catalog was the Hackers Conference in 1984. Um, the bearded guy in the top left there is John Draper, known as Captain Crunch. Uh, he was jailed for being a hacker. And in jail, the mob broke his back to get his secrets of how to do hacking. Um, he was out by the time of this. There's a brand new Macintosh on the left, and two of the developers of the Macintosh are leaning forward. They're looking at somebody's demo. I want to point out that hackers' conferences go on all the time. This is, in a sense, one um, that we're in here, but also on the screen is the iGEM Jamboree, which is 10 years old. This is, these are biohackers, and they're uh, basically hacking biocode, the genetic code. Uh, currently, they are up to 3,000 uh, participants in 300 student teams that come and create organisms and basically race them and uh, get prizes. And this is the long-term project of 10 years of basically making the world safe for biotechnology. It's an awesome project. It is one of the most th thrilling things to go to. It feels sort of like this event in terms of just getting a sense of hope and excitement and lots of things you can do. 
Um, what I'm involved in now is partly biotechnology, bringing it to wildlife conservation, and then partly the Long Now Foundation based in San Francisco, uh, where among other things, we are, have been for 25 years now working on a 10,000 year clock designed by Danny Hillis. Um, it is being installed, as you can see here, inside a mountain in West Texas, in a mountain range that Jeff Bezos owns. And that clock will tick faithfully for more than 10,000 years. Just a permission to think long term. One of the things that emerged from all of that is our idea of a, of a sort of a pace layered diagram of, of a healthy civilization, um, going from very rapidly moving fashion all the way down to very slow moving nature and culture. And those are separate layers, they need to be respected as separate layers. And most of the power is in the slow part, and most of the uh, learning is in the fast part. We can come back to this if you want. But the customer of the Long Now Foundation, and I think the customer of Ethereum, is civilization. Uh, this is the local fragment of it. There's the kind of a big picture of civilization as a whole. That's, that's who we're working for, in my view. Is that okay? Hmm. We can go back to any of these. So thanks. you've, uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, you've been walking around, yeah. yeah. So this is your first uh, DEF CON, of course, and this is your first blockchain conference. Yeah. And uh, you've come at a great time, it seems, actually. Okay. Yeah, it's fantastic. It's really a very special event. Um, you know, I know you've been talking to a lot of people as you've been walking around. You've seen a lot of talks. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm curious to know, I mean, uh, what is your impression of all of this? Is this, is this how these things happen? Mm. Back in the day when we, another thing I did was called Global Business Network and we pervade scenario planning to corporations and governmental departments and so on. Things that were big and slow and had to think ahead in order to decide what to do next. And um, they were always wondering what's going on. And one of the things I said is, that we noticed is, look where there's new terminology emerging. And so with the hackers, for example, there were a whole bunch of kind of hacker terms that emerged. In fact, there was a hacker dictionary that was kind of carefully maintained because newcomers to that world would need to know what, you know, what is this shorthand for. And I could well imagine there should be, if there isn't already, a, a blockchain dictionary, an Ethereum dictionary. And, and you see it in different, you know, new words, DAP, new word. Uh, you see it in words that are repurposed, wallet and fork and beacon. Um, you see it in joke words like hodl. And uh, that's a sign to me that new words have to, it's not just for decoration. They are new tools and they need new words to express them. And so part of what I've been doing as a guest here is just sort of learning some of the vocabulary. And with vocabulary, you start to learn the system. That's what I've been getting here. Mm -hmm. And since you've been a part of so many different, let's call them hacker movements, and especially, mm -hmm. you know, you've, you yourself have participated in providing these civilization hacks, as you mm -hmm. described. I mean, you, you've identified some things that, that kind of give away the game that say, like, you maybe you're onto something, mm -hmm. give you a little whiff of it. But what I'm interested in here is having some of these folks who are doing this now mm -hmm. uh, to be able to have a perspective on this, to see that, you know, they're part of a long history of this kind of stuff. To take this home, what is the, what is the thing that connects it together? Um, early on, we had no idea that uh, the hackers in 1984-85 had no idea that hacking would eventually get industrialized and weaponized. And that would become a... So, you know, one of the things we're saying, well, there's black hat hackers and white hat hackers, and don't worry. And um, we did not prepare enough for the problems that might occur. I think blockchain is doing a better job of that than, than we did. Uh, I think the biotech crowd is doing a better job of that. Can you elaborate on that a little bit? Why, why so? Well, so, you know, there's not a lot of talk of ethics here at all. There was no women involved at all. We had like a hundred hackers there. Two might have been female. Uh, boy, has that changed. Um, none of them were athletic. 
And I see a fair amount of fairly um, athletic-looking characters here, so that's changed. And it's also a good sign. There's a, you know, across-the-board health going on. What Stephen Levy is the guy who wrote the book Hackers. He's in the far left there, up in the upper corner. And um, he was recently asked to reminisce about this, and he said what he remembered was the laughter. That basically, these young hackers spent three days and all night uh, just giggling away. It's the first time they'd come together. And these kind of comings together have that quality of glee about them that I think is, is part of what makes it go. Um, I want to apologize for overvalorizing hackers. And, and uh, what, this, this tend to, they tend to be the star of the personal computer show. But we were actually, you know, they thought of themselves as masterless samurai. But frankly, most of the real engineering was done by people who are narrow ties, who work nine to five, often with federal government money, like the Doug Engelbart, uh, mother of all demos. Everybody worked at SRI, working with the Department of Defense money. And uh, people in Xerox Park, that was corporate money. That was, you know, devised the, the things that became the really graphic interface for what became the personal computer. And Steve Jobs came over. Steve Wozniak was at this thing, Jobs didn't. Jobs wasn't a hacker, Jobs was a marketer. Uh, but but uh, Wozniak was a hacker. And Apple then took what was going on and being completely wasted at Xerox Park by the Xerox company and then uh, you know, deployed it. And then they got copied by uh, Microsoft slash IBM and you're off and running. So. Hackers are important as part of any of these stories, and they're the sort of the glory part, but they're not necessarily the only part or even the main part. So that actually brings up something for me that I wanted to get your perspective on as well, which is what is the role of institutions <laughs> in something like this? Because on the one hand, institutions have a lot of money, and they have a lot of power, and they have a lot of guys in skinny ties who can just do the work. But on the other hand, I'm going to read another quote from Finite and Infinite Games here. Um, hmm. This was one that really stuck with me, um, that a successful defense of society against the culture within itself is to give artists a place by regarding them as producers of property. And I think that extends to a lot of forms of revolution and forms of dissidence. You schedule the protest. You know, it will be happening from 1 to 3 p.m., so find a different way home. Mm. And it's a very effective way to sort of disempower a movement, to give it a safe place in which to have its revolution so that everyone else can go on about their business. And so there's that danger to me mm. when trying to sort of compromise or trying to work with institutional powers that we maybe give up what's most important because it's also what's most inconvenient for them. <laughs> Ethereum's an institution. Um, Touche. <laughs> and, but that, 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 that's saying that, you know, what, what's the solution to bad code? Solution is better code. I, I think institutions is how humans collaborate on things. I mean, we say civilization is 10,000 years old. And in a sense, what that's honoring is the invention of agriculture and the institutions of towns. And then the, 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 the way that people could collaborate at more levels than just hunting and gathering uh, once you've got towns. And you're off and running in the story of civilization is 10,000 years old and there's every reason to believe it'll go another 10,000. And in, in a way, anything that we do as innovators is blending in with that long story. A lot of it is institutional. And <clears throat> the things that corporate misdeeds and government misdeeds want to be, need to be called out, need to be answered, need to be worked around. It's just, you know, a lot of it is just class. Sometimes we try to get, well, if people would just behave better, then we wouldn't have this particular problem. And the reason that the whole catalog had access to tools under the title was that, as our function, is that I had believed Buckminster Fuller, who said early on 
if all the politicians in the world died next week, uh, it would be an exciting week, but things <laughs> wouldn't change that much. But if all the engineers and scientists died next week, uh, we would be at a loss how to carry on. And that human nature is um, very difficult to move. It's a very complicated and rich thing. Um, tools are easy to move. They're easy to invent. They're easy to deploy when they work. And uh, so his approach was the hack is just make a better tool that works around the things that you think are, are not working well in the world. And sometimes that is, involves inventing new institutions. And so you have nonprofits come along, and you have a whole, there was the private sector and the public sector of government, and then a whole social sector that's emerging uh, in different rates in different societies. But there it is. It's a, basically a self driving service structure. So these are all institutional inventions with tools, part of what enables them to ideally be more benign or uh, truly uh, beneficial. That sounds really general. It does, and I wonder what happens when they fight back, when what they're interested in most is not being benign, but just continuing to exist, whether or not they serve a purpose? It is the case, I know, with corporations and probably with governments that, uh, we, you know, a lot of us get worked up about how they're just about profits. They're not. Um, when you actually work with these companies, uh, what they're mostly about is survival, and typically what is for them a very competitive uh, industry, whatever it may be, and they're always figuring out what's gonna come along and just blow them away. And they, they either just fail and disappear like Sears is in the process of doing in the US, or they get gobbled up by another company and sort of disappear into that. So that survival instinct at the institutional level can get um, pretty tough. And that is worth bearing in mind because they, they are legally people, but they don't act like people. <laughs> and I think it's, it's right to call that out. Uh, so head it off every way you can. Sometimes, and one of the things I love about Cory Doctorow's book, Walk Away, is sometimes just walk away. Find a way to live separately. Uh, this was a thing that was done very much in the 60s, and uh, it gave us a fair amount of, one, education. We went out and all started communes, which failed. Um, and it was highly educational in how they failed. And it also gave us a sense that we, there were a lot of things we thought we were dependent on that we were not actually all that dependent on. And so you, you find your own freedom from these institutions. That's an ongoing process, and it's not going to stop. Um, and I think what you want to do when you're building an institution is have in mind the institutions that have gone somewhat <clears throat> harmful or even pathological to notice how that happened there and see if you can head it off, recognize it early on, head off the things that are moving in that direction. But it, civilization is an argument, <laughs> and sometimes blood is shed in that argument. Um, that is probably with us for a while. So, on the topic of walkaways, You know, the people here are building, I would say, like the next generation of human coordination tools. Mm -hmm. I think it's a good general way of saying Fantastic, it. Fantastic, yeah. Um, and the thing about that is, it may end up empowering a million subcultures mm -hmm. for governance, for finance, for all these kinds of things, which means that coordination itself amongst those groups may be more difficult in the future before it's easier. And I know that your big concern, your greatest concern for the world right now is, for example, climate change. Mm -hmm. And we don't have much time, according to you, about, about this topic. So how do these things work together? Well, this is a question I keep asking uh, blockchain people. What have you got to help head off climate change? Mm -hmm. And um, what have you got? Well, it's a, <laughs> it's a good question. Good question. Yeah, yeah. But I think the question is more about this, this narrative of, of 
let's say, mass walkaways. If mm -hmm. everyone walks away, who's going to steer the ship, so to mm -hmm. speak? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and walkaway is a, it's what adolescents do. <laughs> uh, it's what being in your 20s is about. It's um, you know, the, the origin of a lot of uh, all institutions are bad, all governments are bad. I'm going to you know, invent my way out of here, and cryptocurrency is my escape from all of those things. And um, then you get a little older, and, and <laughs> forms of collaboration start reasserting themselves as absolutely necessary. And you find you get into politics, and in order to get anything done, you actually have to find ways to compromise with the opposition, or you have a non-functional government, which we currently have in the U.S. because of failure to do that. And that is not a diminution. That is a growing into a form of responsibility and maturity and public service that just acknowledges um, there is no way. Fair enough. Scattered applause. On that. <laughs> <laughs> so that does get at something else that we talked about briefly leading up to this, um, but and it's what happens as people age within a movement. Because as you said, it's, hmm. it's young people. It's people mm -hmm. who get upset at their metaphorical parents and go off to do their own thing, mm -hmm. and after a while, Maybe they get tired. Maybe they have other things to worry about. Maybe they worry for their own safety or that of their families, or maybe mm. they just sort of stop caring. What happens as people age who have started a movement, and like, is there a way for movements to carry on even as they lose their youth? Most of the... Well, this happened with these hackers' conference. The picture's still up here. And there. Uh, my rule back then was never do a second annual anything, <laughs> uh, which speaks to what you're talking about, but the people at the Hyrule con Conference loved it so much that they, two years later, did their own and then another one. It goes on to this day. And uh, it's an old folks gathering, uh, which is kind of great. And, you know, it's like a class reunion or something. Um, they never, the web came along without really engaging them, so other entities come along. And, but frankly, what happened is um, good scientists, good artists, good engineers keep moving. Uh, we live longer and longer lives. I'm 79 and in good health. And, uh, you know, my parents uh, pretty much checked out by the time they were in the 70s. So, you know, just in one generation, we're getting significantly longer. And I suspect your generation is going to live a lot longer than that. And you're going to have three digit lives, 100 plus. And uh, if there's children, there's going to be, you know, not just grandchildren, great-grandchildren, maybe great-great-grandchildren to deal with. Um, that, if you're still doing the same goddamn thing through that whole period, <laughs> uh, you better be doing it very well. But most people that move on, and actually being an artist in New York back in the day was the great releaser for me that if you're not, you know, if you get stuck in a blue period, you're not Picasso you're going to move on to something that is much more dangerous and much more interesting. Um, one of the Nobel Prize winners I, I, in economics that I got to know uh, said that basically he changes his discipline every seven years. And the thing that he worried about getting a Nobel Prize is that it would stop him in the way it stopped so many scientists who've gotten a prize like that. So it's not walk away, it's keep moving. Hmm. You want to take some questions? You want to take some questions? Say again? You want to take some questions from the audience? Oh, yeah. All right. Does anybody have any questions? Let me see. I'm going to move it. If you do, please come up to the microphones. I'm yeah, there's microphones hither and yon. These guys will call you out. We got one ready over here. Hi, Stuart. Uh, really enjoyed this uh, talk. Uh, I just want to tackle, perhaps you asked a very pertinent question. Uh, what's blockchain doing about uh, you know, global change or climate change? 
And uh, perhaps from an engineering point of view, we're looking to, take, to make things more efficient, perhaps cut down processes, uh, cut down wastage. Um, the other point as well, which uh, is, you know, how do we look after all these people in the world when they're getting more efficient at producing goods? And perhaps we are digitizing the economy so people will have more chance to create stuff and create a digital economy, which uh, involves moving electrons around rather than atoms. Maybe that's very abstract, but uh, we have to, you know, we can't keep creating more stuff because we're running out of stuff in terms of, uh, you know, iron or, or sort of natural resources. So perhaps that's a way out for us that we create a digital economy where people can still create uh, in different ways and yet uh, we serve each other without actually using up more, more of the Earth's resources. So does it make any kind of sense to you at all? I'm not as worried about because I'm a lifelong conservationist and, and I suppose environmentalist, um, I think we overstate the limits of resources. You know, the bet that was made long ago by Julian Simon with my old teacher Paul Ehrlich as to whether the prices would go up or down of a whole basket of uh, things that they were looking at. And uh, Julian Simon won, the prices stayed down and Paul Ehrlich lost on that as well as on population. Um, there's, you're seeing a version of that now, I'm sort of extrapolating from where you're going on this finite earth thing, um, existential crisis. There's an existential danger from AIs, there's an existential danger from uh, climate change, there's an existential danger from extinctions, which are not happening as rapidly as people think. Um, any minute now, somebody is probably going to point out the existential danger of blockchain. Um, they already have. They have? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Say, yeah. What's, how does it work? Well, you know, it's... Uh, I, I, I don't think that's actually a real existential danger, but it's the... Of course it's not. The, well, it's, it's the danger of, you know, being able to, for example, move value uh, freely. Uh -huh. You know, that's, that's, that could be a danger for someone. That could be. I think, uh, yeah, the idea of, say, a private transaction is rather terrifying to many people, or just yeah. the idea of putting more and more machines on the blockchain, like what happens when they start to think without our mm -hmm. help? Um, and they start to have, be able to spend uh, money without our help. Right, <laughs> what yeah. happens when they just yeah. start buying things from each other? Um, I think that there have been many fears expressed. A lot of them have to do with just sort of fear of the unknown, because mm -hmm. Blockchains make a lot of things unknown by design. Uh, yeah, and AI has that quality to, oh God, what's the AI gonna do? Um, but I think there's also something very scary about allowing people to interact with each other without sort of coordinating powers, mm -hmm. without authorities so telling them how they should do so. Mm -hmm. um, and actually, I'm just gonna exercise stage privilege right now and bring this to a topic that I think I would like to hear you speak on a little bit as well, which is um, informal economies, slums and uh, squatter cities. Mm -hmm. uh, this is something that you've written about quite a lot mm -hmm. and I think it's something that's extremely applicable to what we're doing. We're mm -hmm. talking about tools for basically for coordinating in in a situation where there is no authority or maybe, maybe the authority is unnecessary. Mm -hmm. um, or antagonistic. Or mm -hmm. antagonistic. Um, and I'm curious whether you see any assumptions being made or sort of any conceits being held that might find us building the wrong tools or mm. those tools in the hands of the wrong people. Tools in the hands of the wrong people. The, hmm, I wound up writing about, it's a book called Whole Earth Discipline, which begins saying there's sort of three long, <clears throat> long-term narratives that are playing out in this century that I was focusing on in the book. It's urbanization, biotechnology, and climate change. And those are not stories that are gonna be over in a week or a year or a decade. They're gonna go on all century. And the urbanization aspect I sort of started with because that's the main event and um, the villages of the world are emptying out. And you go, oh my God, those wonderful villages. Well, you know, subsistence agriculture is a big drag. It's a, that's why the communes failed, uh, in part. It is a, 
ecological disaster often because they're in marginal land. It's a poverty trap and uh, they're not in a cash society and so they, there's no way out. People go to town and they go to town and where you begin in town if you don't have any money because you're coming from a village is you go to the squatter cities, to the slums. And then there's this informal economy going on there of Talk about microfinance. I mean, these are you know, rickshaw ride fees that you're uh, working with and swapping something to a teacher so that your kids can go to the private school uh, 100 yards away from where the shack you're living in. And that is where the main demographic event of our world is going on. It is where uh, women are having fewer children because in the country, you need seven kids in order to run a farm. And in town, you want to have two kids, and they're going to be high-quality kids because you're going to try to get them education so they can prosper in town, uh, two or less. And then the women, if they're with a jerk in the village, they're stuck with a jerk, but they get to town, they don't have to put up with them anymore. And, you know, they're gone. They take kids with them. And start things. And the women are doing the urbanization of the world, as near as I can tell. So then what helps that? Well, I used to go to all these personal computer conferences back in the 80s and on into the 90s, and they would always end with, uh, this last session would be about how we're going to fix the digital divide, where us rich people have all these cool tools, and those darn poor people, they don't get to have these cool tools, but we'll make sure that we get them, and you know, the vows would be bowed and all that. Um, Kevin Kelly pointed out, you know, thank God for the rich people who will spend insane amounts of money for a new tool that doesn't work yet. And will help it down <laughs> with their extra money, help it down the learning curve to where it actually works, at which people, at which point poor people grab it and run to the horizon with it. And so when cell phones hit the developing world, they proliferated. And you can get a better cell signal in most of Africa than you can in most of the United States. And there's more stuff going on with cell phones and now smartphones than uh, in many other places, and they invented them to ways to do money with M-Pesa in, in Africa and so on. There is so much resourcefulness. There is so much ingenuity. Um, it, is, it takes a lot of skill to be poor, to manage poverty, to manage yourself out of poverty. These are very able people, and they will take any tool that helps them get up in the world. And if you, if you can generate tools and sort of make them accessible and they get invited in, you don't come in saying, hey, here we're here to fix your cooker situation or the way you do uh, commerce here in, in uh, Mumbai. Uh, that usually doesn't fly unless it's really good. Uh, so get invited and then watch it transform by the locals into local businesses, into uh, whatever it is that works with their culture, with their situation. And um, when it works, it can fly fast like cell phones did. And I think potentially blockchain, if it really, really can deliver value uh, in an easily leverageable way, people will grab it as they grab cell phones. And if it doesn't, it won't. Mm -hmm. Should we take another question? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Thank you. Hi, sir. Uh, I wanted to ask, what is um, uh, underpriced or what do we not understand the value of or the importance of? Uh, whether that's culture or technology, what are the things that we're not really getting the fundamental relevance of? I'm so hard of hearing, I need that repeated. He asked, what are we, uh, what are we undervaluing? What are we undervaluing or underpricing or misunderstanding the importance of? What are the things that we should be really focusing on that we're not paying enough attention to? I don't know enough to answer that well. I'm still at the, oh my God, this is astounding level. <laughs> and so I see nothing but uh, glory in all directions here. And so I, I, I can't do critique yet, and probably ever. But there, boy, are there people here who can. <laughs> Stuart, that's not helpful at all. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's not, but you know, to be invited a newbie, he's going to just be all gaga, and that's me. <laughs> all right, one more question. Thank you. So this is a room full of people endeavoring to build very powerful tools. Historically, those who have created powerful tools in earnest goodness 
have then seen those tools immediately weaponized by those who don't really care about that. Mm -hmm. And then a power, power taken away from those with goodwill and moved into those who will use the tools for their own self-improvement. Is there any advice you have to the people in this room actively building on how to uh, create, a, create a nuclear reactor without creating a nuclear weapon? Hmm. Nice way to put it. Mm. This may be one of the functions of good government, is a kind of a, a regulatory oversight. Um, and a, a book I'm recommending along with Finite and Infinite Games is a new book by Michael Lewis called The Fifth Risk. It happens to be about the US government. But it tells astonishing truths for people that, that didn't know things were out there. Government, governments vary, but a lot of amazingly valuable stuff goes on in government that is not actually taken enough advantage of, data collection in particular. And of course, we all worry about data collection in terms of invasion of privacy and so on. But a lot of it is just what's the ground truth of the society that you're in. And, and then with that, ground truth, you're, the tools you're making, particularly coordination tools like yours, can reflect, can learn about reflecting stuff that's real in the world. So working with government, um, helping make sure that transparency is part of the deal. Uh, one of the reasons this book of Michael Lewis's is pretty angry is that the current administration in the United States is trying to shut down access to this information because they disapprove of it, because it's science, basically. And uh, that's the thing worth fighting. So, you know, in a funny situation, suddenly instead of fighting government, we're trying to fight for government at its best. And I think this kind of, and this is one of the things the Ethereum group is better at than, say, the Bitcoin crowd, is figuring out what are the points of already existing institutions like governments that are worth not just honoring, but really engaging in helping and helping keep non-destructive, non-harmful. It is, you know, there, there's lots of ways things can go wrong and one of the functions of uh, government, yeah. one of the things that governments do is collect weather data. And uh, people are much less killed by hurricanes now than they used to be because weather prediction has gotten good in the last 20 years, really good. Uh, likewise, medicine, a lot of medical research goes on under the National Institutes of Health and things like this, and that is why medicine, it used to be a, a flip a coin whether going to a doctor was gonna help or, or make things worse. Now it's pretty much across the board, it'll mostly help. So it, find the institutions that are doing valuable things, burrow in to where the good stuff is and help the good stuff and do what you can to head off or work around the bad stuff. Um, and, you know, eternal vigilance. <laughs> but don't solve a problem just because you can imagine it. This is... Uh, you know, Jimmy Wales tells the, the fable of the steak knives, where he was uh, finding that with the, the programmers that were coming around Wikipedia when it was starting up, they would figure out all the different kinds of problems that would happen, and they would design software uh, that, would, that would see that problem and immediately head it off. Well, the problem didn't exist yet. And what Jimmy Wales said is, You're, you are making the steak knife problem. This is, you hire an architect, and you're gonna run a uh, steak restaurant, and the architect says, I hear you're gonna have these sharp knives on every table. Well, that's obviously very dangerous. Anybody could go berserk and kill not only everybody at their table, but everybody at all the other tables. We've gotta put these little cages around each table in sort of modularity that'll uh, you know, at least isolate the bug. Uh, yeah except nobody actually does that in these restaurants. And so Jimmy says, wait until you have a problem. Be really alert for the problems. Ask people to tell you about the problems early and often, and you know, go right after them. But if you over-anticipate them, you will design freedom out of the system. 
Thank you. Mm. I think we have, I think we have I? time for one more question. Oh, okay. Hi, um, my name is Matthew DeSilva, and I'm a journalist for Quartz. Uh, first, I just want to say I feel privileged to be in the same room as you. Uh, I just finished reading The Innovators, and I was astounded just by your history, and I'm, I'm just, I'm so, feel so lucky to be here. Um, my question is about the kind of inequality even within the blockchain space. Um, even in the blockchain space, there's a lot of economic inequality, very, like from the very starting point of a project, um, whether it's in governance or distribution of tokens um, or just in you know social power. And I was wondering how you might suggest addressing those kind of inequalities as projects grow. Hmm. I don't know enough. Um, I really try not to opinionate where I'm hopelessly ignorant. And this is one of those cases. But thank you for the praise. And it's a nice book that Walter Isaacson wrote. Thank you for being here. Um, I, well, that was disappointing. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to challenge you a little bit, though. Maybe we can end on this instead. Um, about not building for problems that we haven't discovered yet. Mm -hmm. um, I think Wikipedia is the best example of what can happen. Mm. If you don't build <laughs> for problems that haven't happened yet, Wikipedia is like one of the shining beacons of what can happen when humanity gets together on the internet. Um, I think that there are other things where we didn't anticipate problems that we maybe should have. Mm -hmm. I think social media, for example, is a terrifying place and there are things that maybe weren't inevitable, but that feel inevitable now given the decisions that we made. And like, is there a balance between anticipating the horrible things that could go wrong without building so many walls around ourselves that we can't have any fun. I happen to live an early version of social media with the well back in the 1980s. And um, we discovered trolls. <laughs> uh, See, you really were there for everything. Yeah. <laughs> and we discovered the main rule, which is never feed the troll. Mm -hmm. um, we discovered flame wars, we discovered uh, mob action. I got mobbed at one point and became so disgusted I left the well. I felt like, like it was a failed experiment. Uh, but it was a better experiment than many, and here I will get into, uh, I think, somewhat controversial area here, which is that um, anonymity is way better in theory than it is in practice. And to the extent that blockchain can give verifiable identity, uh, that's going to be one of its great values in the world, not only in the developing world where people need an ID in order to you know, own property and get loans and things like that, but um, that bots can be bots on social media. I mean, the original idea of Facebook, as I understood it, is, is that you, know, you were basically verified by mutual friends who said, this is a real human being with, and this is a real, real name. And I wished that we had done that with the well. We had pseudo-anonymity in the well, because I'd already seen anonymity be really, really pathological on other systems. And I, as near as I can tell, um, there are special cases where anonymity can be important, where privacy can be important, where private conversations are important. But in general, a lot of anonymity in general discourse is destructive. And um, a whole part of blockchain is protecting privacy, but I think a whole part of it is going to be, in a sense, the opposite of being to really be who you are. And, and the thing I tried to make clear on the well when we started is, you know, the byline I put out there was, you own your own words. I didn't want to be sued for people you know, insulting each other. Um, that got mistaken into thinking that you had property rights over your own words, which is another stupid question. Uh, <laughs> you have responsibility for your own words, but there needs to be a responsibility bearing creature behind that for that to actually hold. And so that's where I come down on that one. And I think we're Right at the end of everything. That's right at time. Do you want to? You want to? Yeah. Um, I just would like to thank you again, Stuart, for being here. It's been really a pleasure getting to know you, and yeah. I'm really glad that this was the DevCon that you came to because it has been amazing, 
and to the organizers, you are amazing. Yeah. <laughs> this thing that you created has really, it's been extremely special. And so thank you and thank all of you. And we'll see you next year. Yeah, thanks, guys. Good